Hello. Hello, Fede. How are you guys? Good. The stream is up. The webinar is up. We're ready. Good. Uh, the day has come finally. Indeed. <laughs> uh, good job, Faith. Good organization. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> you there, Faith? So how, how are we going to do, um, uh, I, I think, oh, how are you? <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, yeah. Um, okay. I'm waiting for Alice to join us. I think she was asking for the link to join us as a panelist. So I thought that once want to join, um, Dan John, we had that as a panelist. Okay, who, who speaks first, uh, me or Alice? You can't hear me. So how are we going to do this? So Faith, are you going to welcome people? Do you want me to do it? Um, how it's, uh, you know, the logistics going to work? We can have Faith introduce the event and then you, any one of you can start. I think that's that's the best. I don't know what Faith thinks. I think I think Alice should start. Sounds good. Okay, so Faith, then she introduces Alice, and then Faith uh, takes back the control, and then she introduces me. I speak, and then oh, maybe Faith can say some final words, and that's it, right?
Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever you are in, on Planet Head. So, we are going to be starting our Claros Africa Community Media event. And we're so happy to have you all join us. Oh, I can see how our panelists and speakers are now with us. So today we are going to be having presentations and discussions that will be around our topic, which happens to be blockchain and its impact on legal transformation in Africa. As we already know, automation is now being seen in virtually all aspects of life. And this also means people will want this solution to follow suit, if not faster than how automation works. And very soon we'll probably see that justice delayed could very well be justice demand. So I'm going to go straight into introducing um, our first speaker, which happens to be Federico Haas. Or uh, Alice, would you like to go first? No, it's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll go after Federico. Okay. All right, let me introduce Federico then. Federico has graduated in economics and philosophy from the University of Buenos Aires and holds a PhD in management from IAE Business School. He is the founder and CEO of Claris, a legal tech company using game theory and blockchain technology in arbitration. As a pioneer in the field of decentralized justice, he has lectured in universities such as Stanford, Oxford, and Columbia. He is alumni at Singularity University and hosts the first Coursera course about blockchain in Spanish. He is passionate about exponential technologies such as artificial intelligence, crowdsourcing, and blockchain for social innovation. He is a third speaker. So we are going to now hand over the floor to Federico. And after him, we would have Alice. And then after Alice, we would have the general question and answer session. So as the sessions go on, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. And once we get to the question and answer session, we will answer all questions together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Faith. Um, thank you for putting together this uh, wonderful event. Uh, we're very excited about this uh, introduction of Cleros into the, the African and legal tech community. And I'm also very honored to have Alice, who's going to be speaking uh, after me. So very happy that you're here, Alice, too. So let me give you first um, an introduction to what is blockchain, uh, what are smart contracts, and what is, in general, decentralized justice. Um, first, um, to get into the blockchain topic. So let's remember when blockchain was born. It was in 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis in Wall Street, the subprime mortgages crisis, um, when all the world seemed to be falling apart. So there was um, this guy, this woman, or this group of people who published this paper um, uh, called uh, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer economic cash system under the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. And so this introduced the first uh, cryptocurrency uh, in the world, which was based on a new technology called blockchain. So people typically explain blockchain with some very complex and cryptographic uh, concepts. So they have a better idea. Um, it involves going to this island, uh, which is called the island of Yap. And this island is in the Micronesia, which is a very beautiful place between uh, Australia and the Polynesia. So in this island, you have the, the, this tribe called the Yaps. And the Yaps, um, they have this very particular um, currency system, which is based on these big stones called the ray stones, which are, are kind of a, in the shape of a donut. Um, so these stones are their money. As we have like uh, coins and bills, they have um, rocks. And so why 
do they have the um, hole in the center? Well, because if you need to make a transaction, your friends can help you putting a stick in the middle and then transporting the stone. But you know, in the end, uh, the YAP discovered that this way of um, making payments wasn't very practical. So they decided that instead of moving around the stones, why don't we just leave them in a place and they don't move and we just remember who the owner of each stone is, right? So this uh, faced them with another problem, which is how do you know who owns uh, each stone? And one alternative they consider was, okay, let's name up one member of the tribe so he will be the um, in charge of remembering who owns each stone. Uh, but this had a problem. What if this guy just like died or he forgot or got bribed? Or what if he just one day he decided to start like taking fees for every transaction that was done in the, the island? So since the YAP didn't want to run the risk of putting the monopoly of money uh, into the hands of just one guy, they said, okay, let's distribute all the knowledge of the stone ownership between all of the members of the tribe. So each of the members of the tribe had to remember who was the owner of each stone from the moment uh, the stone was carved until the present day. So they had to know all the hands through which each stone had, had gone through in, in the stone history. So if Alice wanted to make a payment to Bob, uh, so she just gathered all the tribe into the like the beach, and then she's announced publicly. Okay, you know the the, the stone which is like uh, near the the palm tree at the end of the beach. So now it's going from Alice to Bob, uh, and all of the members of the tribe they just watch the transaction, and so they updated their mental registry, their mental ledger of stones from uh, Alice uh, to Bob, right? So if Alice now wanted to make another payment, again, with the same stone, so all of the rest of the members of the tribe, they would just say, yo, Alice, you can't do this because you already used this stone. It doesn't belong to you anymore, right? So this was a way in which the, the YAP discovered that was more efficient and more secure to handle their monetary system. And it's kind of the same underlying, underlying logic of the blockchain. Like just replace the memory of these little guys by uh, computers and just replace this ray stone uh, in, by a digital asset called Bitcoin or crypto asset in general. And this is how more or less uh, blockchain works, right? So it's a network of computers where each of the nodes uh, have, has an um, uh, exact copy of the ledger about how many assets are in each account. So if some, someone wants to make a payment to another account. So they have this uh, secret key that is like the bank password. And this gives you the right to, to sign transactions in order to move funds from your account. So let's say uh, I, I want to uh, make a payment. So I just go with my password and I sign the transaction. And this makes my computer tell to the network, okay, uh, there's going to be a transaction, a transfer from of from this computer to this computer of like one bitcoin and so after the rest of the computers see the transaction or the order so they update the, the ledger from the previous state to the current state and that's how the the payment is, is done right um and this is how the system looks in the bitcoin blockchain so you can see the little um <clears throat> strings of letters and numbers which are the uh, account numbers if you want and then uh, there is this account number to the base to that other account number x amount of assets and so um, the interesting thing about this is that everyone can see how much is transacted everyone can see how much was how many assets are in each account but no one knows who is behind this um, this account, so they don't know who the real owner is. Um, this kind of gives the the, 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 the crypto assets um, feature. It's like cash, you know, cash. You can use it for making transactions, but it's anonymous, right? So you can um, use it without people knowing who who you are. 
and it's accepted anyway, which is not the case with bank accounts. Bank accounts need to well tell who is the owner, um, okay, etc. So this is why Satoshi Nakamoto called the Bitcoin like digital cash, right? Because it has got these properties of, of cash. And I think to remember now is that a blockchain, the technology blockchain is a distributed, shared, and very secure database. Uh, in the sense of like no one can make arbitrary changes into the database. Uh, so because no one owns it, it's owned by the community, right? So no one can make changes uh, like adding or subtracting uh, assets from account. Um, of course, people know, and people typically are interested in blockchain because of uh, cryptocurrencies and because they can help make payments like much um, uh, cheaper, you know, if you have a weak bank account or a, a weak financial system in your country, transactions tend to be very expensive. Uh, I live in Argentina and you have, there is like the bank system is very, very poor and very weak. And so you may need to pay like lots of, um, yeah, lots of uh, fees for making simple payments. And sometimes you can't even do them. Uh, I'm sure the situation in Africa is, is uh, quite similar in, in many countries as well. Uh, well, you, you of course you already know about M-Pesa and all the digital like, mobile money movement started uh, like more than ten years ago, before even before blockchain. So the, the potential of blockchain to enable like financial transactions, which are very cheap and very efficient, is that they don't. It doesn't need to to, to rely on this like very like um, uh, complex and uh, yeah and. Um, monopolized system for for payments especially when you have to make a payment in an international setting uh, like how much it costs making a, a transfer of money from argentina to nigeria like uh, imagine how many intermediaries are there and each of them charging a, a fee well this payment can be done like at almost near zero cost with the blockchain right but we are not here to speak about finance we're here to speak uh, more about another very important topic which uh, affects the uh, blockchain technology, which is smart contracts, and which has the potential of transforming uh, law, right? Um, the concept of smart contracts was introduced in the 1990s by a researcher, cryptographer, legal scholar called Nick Szabo. Uh, and where he published this paper called Smart Contracts, Building Blocks for Digital Free Markets. And his main insight in this, in this paper was that the nature of the economy was changing. It was going from like an analog, like local economy to a global digital economy where things happen in real time and you have e-commerce and you have uh, international payments uh, for different types of services and every, everything like that. And still our human technology for, for making agreements was still based on very old, um, yeah, a very old technology, which is like paper contracts and a, basically 18th century contracts uh, uh, in order to support uh, an economy that was based on 21st century technologies, right? So he proposed that this new technology, this, this new uh, global economy would, re would require a new uh, technology for, for, for making agreements. And this is the example he, he put in his paper. You have Alice and Bob and Alice owns a car and she wants to sell the, the car to Bob in installments. And they make an, an agreement in the form of a smart contract, a digital, a digital contract, where Bob and Alice agree that he will take the car and he will make a payment of like a one coin into the account they agree on every month, right? So Bob takes the car, he goes uh, visit his wife, uh, go to the beach and that, and one day he stops paying. And then what happens, The his digital a card for the key for the car stops working and um, the car doesn't work anymore and Alice can recover the car. She goes and she takes the car with her key that was activated again. And so now she can have the car again and, and everything is solved. So imagine how much and how should have, uh, what, 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 what should have she done to recover her car the car in the traditional legal system. She will have to go, go to, the, to a lawyer and a judge say, okay, look, I have this property right to the car, like this title 
uh, of the car ownership, I had this agreement with Bob uh, saying that he was to pay into this account one coin every month. And then look, he didn't pay. So now she would have to ask the judge to um, pay um, the, so to, to give her back the car. Like how much would this cost to Alice? Like at least maybe the cost of two cars because of legal fees, lawyers and all that. The fascinating thing about smart contracts is that the enforcement is automatic and immediate. Like at the moment that the account where they agreed that the funds would be sent doesn't receive the funds, the contract can automatically enforce the, the rule, so the, 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 the contract, the agreement. So, you know, payment not done, the key is disabled and enabled for Alice, and that's it. And um, this can be done at near zero cost, right? Um, and this is a, like a mind boggling, if you want, development in, in the legal world, as it's everything, almost everything that you could encode under the, the form of if X, then Y, can potentially can be put under the form in a, of a smart contract. Like for example, like let's say uh, there can be an agreement uh, which says that when, if, if the flight leaves like later than 20 minutes, so the passenger is going to be refunded like 20% 20, 20 of, the, of the ticket. So, and this is done automatically after the conditions are met without any need for um, going to a lawyer, going to the airline, going to a regulator, going to anyone. So the smart contract automatically enforces the conditions that are um, set written there at near zero cost, right? Um, you could also have like more complex um, situations where to use smart contract. Like for example, uh, I could write my testament in a, in a smart contract. So let's say I have two kids and I want my kid A to have like 40% uh, of, of my assets and the kid B 60%. Uh, so the moment I, I die, so um, the contract will send the funds in the pre-established uh, way in, to, the, to the recipients. And you can like do this uh, testament execution like at almost near zero cost and immediately, right? So this is another example where you have the potential of, of smart contract to, to like transform um, some very old legal um, practice. So the idea of smart contracts um, was created in the 1990s by Sabo, but it was just an abstract um, uh, idea for two decades until uh, this guy called Vitaly Buterin, who mm, he must be like 25 now, uh, he um, developed this um, blockchain called Ethereum. Like Ethereum is in many ways the same a blockchain just as the Bitcoin blockchain, but it has an advantage that the coding language is more sophisticated and is especially suited for writing smart contracts uh, of the kind that we, we just saw. So this um, enabled a transformation in the legal world. And one of these transformations that come from the fact of the existence of smart contracts is the new field that we call decentralized justice. So some contracts um, are what we call complete. They, they just can be read by machines and the enforcement is just automated and you don't need humans uh, to do anything because everything is very clear and everything is very, um, clearly encoded into, into the, the computer code. So that kind of contracts are okay. But then you have other contracts, uh, which are especially those contracts that lawyers care more about because they are incomplete in the sense of that they are ambiguous and they are open to interpretation. And when this happens, when there is an ambiguity, there can uh, uh, be a, a dispute because different parties can hold reasonable arguments um, uh, about how the contract should be executed. And this has historically been the, the, the field where lawyers used to work, right? So, um, and uh, in this case, uh, the problem with smart contracts is that they are smart enough to self-execute as they are programmed, but they are not smart enough to resolve situations that require human interpretation because there are some ambiguities and, and some situations that require interpretation, right? So let's see how uh, this 
type of problem can be solved in a system like Kleros. So let's imagine like Alice hires Bob, uh, like Alice is a French entrepreneur and she hires Bob who is in Guatemala to, to build a website for her. And um, they show, they agree on, 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 um, on some uh, specification for the website and after everything is agreed. So Alice sends uh, funds for Bob to work on the, on the website to a smart contract. And they both agree that if a dispute happens in the in this contract, there's an arbitrator called Cleros that's going to solve it. Like in the sense of like uh, arbitration contracts, arbitration agreements are very old, of course, and they are typically used in uh, different fields in the international commerce, oil and gas, and you know lots of different situations. Um, so in this sense, it's the same type of agreement. Parties voluntarily agree that if there is a dispute in their contract. There's going to be an arbitrator, and this arbitrator, they agree, it's going to be Cleros. And the funds that Ali sends to this smart contract are going to be held in escrow there uh, until everything ends. So if Bob complies with what he said he would do, Ali releases the funds, and every, everybody's happy. But if there is a dispute because Ali claims that uh, Bob didn't do uh, a website of enough quality as he promised, so now the funds are going to be locked into that uh, escrow until Cleros makes a decision. And Cleros is going to select a number of, of jurors um, in a, a very transparent way. Cleros is built on blockchain. So all of the, this process of selecting jurors is going to be like very, very transparent. And everyone can see that no one could tamper with the selection of jurors or with the evidence or with any of that. So when these jurors who are like other experts from the crowd in um, um, website and software, they're going to analyze the evidence and they're going to see so see the contract, see the um, the product that was delivered, and then they're going to vote. And depending on how they vote, the funds held in escrow will will move. So this is a bit of the interface that jurors uh, use in Cleros in order to analyze the evidence and in order to well vote. And so in this case, they they vote. Uh, the majority votes that Alice was right. So Cleros tells the smart contract, okay, send back the funds to Alice. So Alice gets back her funds and the situation is, is resolved, right? So an important feature that you need to remember about decentralized justice is that this system is built on blockchain, uh, as I mentioned before. And this uh, makes this is important because of the fact that all of the transaction is going to be very transparent. The evidence is not going to be tampered with, and you can be sure of that. Nobody can uh, select or change how jurors are selected. So you can't put your friends into the jury uh, because you don't control how this is um, how the selection process works. So uh, every legal system always has the requirement of providing what we call rule of law, right? So predictability of how things are going to develop in the legal system. Uh, so good legal systems um, are good at providing rule of law, bad legal systems are bad at that because they may be, there may be corruption or there may be different uh, situations that um, derail the system uh, from what should be expected uh, for it to do. So let me dig a bit, a bit like um, deeper into the jury selection process, right? Um, so this woman, let's say it's a, uh, website designer from Vietnam, and she wants to make some money uh, as an arbitrator in Cleros. So she has a job in the day, and then uh, at the night, she wants to make some extra money and sees arbitrators in Cleros make money by arbitrating cases because of they collect arbitrate, arbitration fees. So she wants to be drawn um, to, in cases in Cleros. So for this, she needs to buy a token called PNK. This is a Ethereum token that is like a lottery ticket that you need to, to deposit into a court in order to be drawn as jurors. So like Cleros has lots of different courts uh, from different uh, uh, situations and different expertise. So in this case, um, she will um, deposit the token into a court of like, let's say marketing services or like a website development. And then uh, this, uh, token that she deposits uh, gives her the right to be chosen as a juror in cases that are 
handled in that core. Uh, and so um, we have lots of people who will stake the token and deposit the token there to be chosen. And Cleros will randomly select, let's say, like five uh, jurors who will analyze the evidence and they're going to vote on who is right. So this um, is five, it could be more, it could be less, it depends on the case. Um, and now, uh, an interesting feature of decentralized justice is that like these jurors, they, they don't have to provide the proof of their identity and they don't have to even provide the proof that they are skilled enough to resolve the case in the court where they will work. So, but so like, how do you know then that uh, they are not going just to, to vote randomly and without uh, any, uh, without analyzing the evidence? How do you know that they're not going to be bribed? So, and for this purpose, like Cleros and decentralized justice systems, they use um, uh, very important um, subfield of economic theory, which is called game theory. And this guy here is Thomas Schelling, his uh, Nobel Prize in Economics 2005. Uh, and you know, uh, game theory uh, is um, a field that studies how people, how agents um, behave in situations where there is um, uncertainty and there is strategic considerations at play and they need to, to decide how to how to optimize their strategy in a situation where others are also trying to optimize their strategies. Um, and so Thomas Schelling was basically well known for an um, interesting concept called focal points. It's how people um, make decisions when they have to coordinate with other people, but they can't communicate with the others or they can't communicate, but they can't trust that they will like uh, behave honestly. Um, so if you see this little exercise, so you have to choose each of you independently need to choose one of these numbers. And if you choose the same one as the majority, you make $20. If you choose a different one, you make $0. So in this situation, um, typically people choose the 1000, right? All of these numbers will be adequate uh, because there's, yeah, any, any of them could be potentially a, a, a good point to coordinate. But since the 1000 looks a bit different and looks like, uh, yeah, it's salient, uh, more salient than the others. So people, people typically will uh, choose that one. And so that one is a focal point in, in, the, in this uh, case, right? So, if you take this logic of the focal points into decentralized justice, let's say you put a number of jurors and they're going to uh, analyze the, the, the same evidence, the same website and the same uh, like, um, uh, product and the same contract. And each of them has the uh, incentive to vote like the majority to earn money. And if they don't do it, they, they don't make money. So the situation, the point in which they will converge is the truth about the dispute, right? The truth understood in a consensual way, in the, the, the community of website developer consensus about what should be ruled in this uh, specific case at, at hand, right? So this creates a situation where users who try to game the system will lose money. Like how could you try to game the system? Well, you could like vote randomly, like just they, you vote A, B, and A, B, A, A, B, you don't, you, without even taking a look at the evidence. Uh, in this case, what happens is that you may um, converge with the majority in some cases, but uh, because you, you can be lucky, but uh, over time, if you keep playing this game, you're going to uh, be incoherent. And remember the token that people had to deposit to be drawn. So that token stays locked into the court until the session ends. So, uh, and if you uh, vote different from the majority, you lose the token and it's sent to the other uh, jurors, right? So if you keep voting incoherently because you don't look at the evidence, you're going to use the token, you're going to lose it and it's going to send to the others. And then you're going to put another token and lose it. And that's how you start losing money until at some point that you exit the system because you, you run out of tokens. On the contrary, if you uh, just um, deposit the token into the right court, into the court where you have expertise and you do an honest work of studying the evidence and carefully voting, then at so sometimes you will maybe um, be wrong because some interpretation matter and there's subjectivity, but 
uh, in general, you know, on average, you will be uh, you will vote coherently with the majority, and then you're going to recover your your token that was taken into the court, and then you are going to, on top of that, make some arbitration fee, right? So in the end, you start making money at the same time that you uh, produce justice in in these different cases, right? So this, are, this takes us to two other important features of uh, decentralized justice. The first one is collective intelligence. The process is built on the idea of peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Uh, user, other users are going to work on solving disputes of, 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 of their peers. Like if you are an expert in website, you can solve disputes happening in website. If you're an expert in insurance, you can solve um, disputes happening in insurance and also the incentive system uh, in decentralized justice, as you have seen, is quite different from the how it works in traditional courts, right? Because of this um, alignment between this looking for fairness and resolving honest in a uh, dispute in a truthful way, and the fact that if you do that, you will make money, and if you don't do that, you will lose money, right? So this. Uh, Cryptoeconomic incentive uh, feature is another important feature of decentralized justice systems. Okay, so this is the theory. What about how does this work, like in, in real in reality? So, in July 2018, we launched the first test of how Claros works with a um, pilot called Dogeson Trial. No, this is this meme is the famous Doge meme. And the test was um, quite simple. Like users had to send images um, of dodges. Um, other users could challenge them uh, if they thought that they should not be accepted uh, as, as dodges images. And so there was a, a clear of jury who was going to decide whether the image that was submitted was or not acceptable, right? And people had uh, an incentive to send images uh, because at each image, image that you sent that was accepted by the juries, uh, you could make a small amount of money, but the, the big incentive was if you got to send an image of a cat and you got that image accept, accepted into the list, then you would make like 50, right? So this was like at the moment like $12,000. So that was an interesting take um, for, yeah, for anyone who is on the internet to try to do that. Um, so this is how it works. And this is, look at how the, the mechanism design works. So Alice sends an image of a dog, of a doge, uh, uh, through a form, and then she makes a deposit, right? So if, and this image stays visible for everyone for a while, for like a couple of days, and then if people don't have anything to say about this because they think that this is a really a, a doge image. So they don't say anything and the image stays on the list and Alice recovers her deposit. But let's say that Alice now sends a, a cat, right? And so people uh, can see it. Oh, this is a cat, they say. And now if you are another user, you can challenge this uh, submission. And now uh, you have a dispute between the submitter who says that this image is a doge and this other guy who says, no, this is a cat. So this should not be accepted into the list. And now what happens, there's going to be a, a dispute that's going to be solved by a Clelos jury. And in this case, the jury decides that the image was not a dosh, so it's rejected. And the, the challenger will keep the funds sent as a deposit by, by Alice. Okay. So this is a mosaic of some of the images that were sent by people. See that people were very creative in sending different doges and because they had to be creative because um, only non-repeated images were accepted. So you could not repeat an image. So you had to design different images and people did all of this. So, And also people try to send lots of cat images. Uh, and these are some of the cat images that were rejected. So you see that people were very creative also in some ways. Look at the image on the bottom, kind of Photoshopped image between like a doge and a cat. So people try different things to, to make a, to, to have the, the image accepted. People tried to do bribes. So this is a bribe attempt that was telling the jurors, hey, let me get into the list with this image and I will share with you the, the, the money. Um, 
this is another uh, bribe attempt that was done, but didn't work either. And then we had like very interesting situations where the community uh, started to make the rules and how jurisprudence and how precedent started to be handled. Um, someone uh, sent this image um, and the jurors said, well, this is not a dodge, of course, this is, uh, well, this is uh, another thing so it should not be accepted. So this image was rejected, but then someone else submitted another image that was this one. It was the same as the previous one, but as you know, if you have been to Venice, you know that, or if you know about Venice history, you know that um, the president of the Republic of Venice in the Middle Ages was called the Doge of Venice. So this image had this uh, legend saying that, and so people in our chat community in our Telegram, they started to discuss, well, this is a Doge or not a Doge. Um, um, well, on the some part of the community said, on one hand, so this is like, yeah, it's a Doge because it's called a Doge and the, the rules say that if it is a Doge, it has to be accepted. But the other part of the community said, yeah, maybe this can be a Doge on, in name, but this is like not a Doge in the essence of Dogeness that is required for being accepted into the list, right? So um, this image was ultimately accepted, but then someone else submitted a different uh, image, which is this one. Um, so Paolo Lucio Anafesto is believed to be the first Doge of Venice, but people are not sure historically, factually, they don't know if he was or not Doge. So now you have two situations. First, is a Venetian Doge acceptable for the list? Second, even if the Venetian Doge is acceptable because it was deemed acceptable in a previous case setting a precedent, is this acceptable? Uh, because we don't know here if factually and historically this guy was or not a Doge. So in this case, the image was, was rejected. Uh, and then that was a, a great way to see how communities uh, start to make precedents and start to build jurisprudence um, and how to start to make decisions based on previous decisions that they already made. And one last example I want to show you. We get this image, this submission with a, this, and this image is not challenged, so it's accepted into the list. So then we have some guy sending us an email saying, hey, you have to pay me the 50 each word because this is a cut and I got this uh, accepted into the list and he sends us this image, right? And he says that this image was the other one from the other side. Um, and well, but we answer, yeah, this could be this, but it could also be this one, right? In this case, it's still a doge. And so you are not entitled to the 50 is the reward. So what we did in this case is make a, a trial between the Pleros team who held that the image was not a, a cat and this guy who held the image was a cat. And the, the question that was asked to Pleros jurors uh, is, does this image clearly show a, a cat? Um, well, there were, there were like many, many discussions, you know, people said, yeah, but these are cat ears, but uh, these are, uh, the, the tail is not from a cat, but these uh, footprints are from a cat. But, but after all this discussion, you know, the jury decided that uh, this was not clearly a cat by two to one. And so this is, this was, I think, the first decentralized justice trial uh, of all time for a very important amount of money. That was for 50 ETH, right? So this was a, a really interesting pilot to see how Kleros could work in a situation where jurors had to evaluate these, these images. But let, let me tell you a bit more about how Kleros works uh, these days and how it actually um, is providing a, a valuable service to the um, uh, crypto community by working as a compliance tool for, um, for, for, for crypto assets. You know? Um, as you may have noticed, so the crypto asset and the crypto community has lots of people doing like scams because of making fake tokens, Ponzi schemes. So, and this is a very hard um, way for, like, in a world that you have more and more tokens created uh, for different things, it's very hard for regulators to keep up uh, with the um, uh, situation and 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 do a, a a good due diligence process to see which tokens to accept uh, and which they, they not. So there can be some uh, private regulation system, this self-regulation system built on Claros, 
um, where the community of crypto holders and the community of crypto who are people who know about uh, how um, to evaluate token and how to um, yeah how, how to make these decisions, they can themselves uh, be those who uh, evaluate tokens in order to detect those that are scam and and eliminate them. So. Um, and this is why we developed uh, an application called Tokens by Kleros. Uh, it's a place where uh, anyone can submit a token uh, if they want it to be part of a list of legitimate tokens. And after you are in this list, you can be like uh, listed into an exchange or, or whatever, right? But the, the point of this list is to create a, a, a list of tokens that are not scam and they comply with different uh, security regulations, right? Um, so this is how it works. And you will see that it's very similar to the Doge on trial experiment. So Alice wants her token to be listed into this, into this exchange, into this list. And then she submits a, a, a form with the features uh, of, of the token and a deposit. And this stays visible for people to see it. Um, in this case, the other users, they decide that this token complies with all the required um, guidelines for being a, a safe token and it's not a scam. Of course, it's not a scam because it's Clearos token at PNK. Uh, so the, the token, this is the, the form where you can submit a token. You don't have to put the name, the address, the ticker, and, and submit a logo. So the token is accepted. It stays on the list. And then Alice recovers the deposit she made. Now, let's say Alice will submit a token, which is a fake token because it's like a Ponzi scheme, right? So users are going to analyze the token. And in this case, uh, one of the users will say, hey, this is a, a fake token. This is a Ponzi. We don't want this in this list and it doesn't comply with the requirements. So he makes another deposit. And now there is a trial between Alice and Bob. Alice says the token should be accepted. Bob says it shouldn't. And a Clearos jury will go into decide, will decide who is right. And in this case, they, they say, no, this token should be rejected. And so the deposit that was made by Alice goes to Bob. And the token is sent out of the list, right? And let me show you how this can be a very powerful tool for, for uh, regulation in, a, in an unregulated space for the moment, right? We had this, co this case, uh, BuyerChain, which is a project called BuyerChain. They submitted the, their token to be listed. And um, they had uh, in their submission, there was this guy called Scott Bingley. And it turned out that this guy was had lots of fake profiles in the in social media. Um, and he claimed to have gone to a, a thing called like Oxford blockchain group. So one of the, the challenger of this case, he like actually like he called Oxford and he asked, hey, I want to speak to Scott Bingley. Uh, no, I never heard of Scott Bingley. And you know, there's an, never heard of a blockchain group at Oxford either. So this was quite a, enough evidence that this was uh, something was smelling very bad in this project and this was rejected. Uh, and you know what, like some time ago, so this was, this case happened in Claro's court in 2019. Like, uh, and in June, 2020, the, the Chinese police, basically they accused this bar chain project of being a Ponzi and this resulted in arrests and all that. But interesting thing is that Cleros was able to detect that this was, a, this was a Ponzi scheme one year before than the authorities. So imagine like uh, how can this real time regulation work for rooting out bad actors immediately and not having to wait for a lot of people like to lose their money until the Chinese police was able to tell that this was a Ponzi. See how powerful this can be in order to clean up the, the crypto ecosystem, right? Um, so how can you get involved with, with Kleros? The first thing is um, join the Kleros community telegram. This is the, 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 the QR code that you can take a picture for uh, joining the main channel. There is another one uh, specifically for, for Africa, uh, which is ma managed by, by Faith. And while Faith will tell you a bit more about that a bit later, I will let, leave this for a while if you want to take a picture and join the group.
another way in which you can participate is join our fellowship. We have this program um, called Fellowship of Justice, where you can um, do some type of research of something that interests you in connection to Cleros, and you will have support from the Cleros team to help you do the, 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 the research. We're going to provide you with support, data, or etc. And there are lots of different students uh, of students or like lawyers or people who are uh, interested in how decentralized justice works, like Luis Bergoya, for example, you see him there, he's a, a student at Stanford, a PhD student, and he's researching how Kleros can be applied in Venezuela, in the Venezuelan context. Uh, Abir, who's a, a arbitrator from India and the UK, and he's researching how to use Kleros in contracts in the oil and gas industry. Uh, well, you have Faith there, of course, he's one of our, of our fellows. Uh, um, Mauricio, for example, Duarte is um, produced a report on how you can use Cleros for energy peer-to-peer -peer, uh, dispute, um, disputes in the energy industry, uh, and well, many other different um, people. Um, each of them researching the case that is of, of interest for them. So the batch, uh, for the fourth batch for the fellowship is open now and closes on Friday. So if you want to to join, like don't miss any. Don't miss the opportunity and there's time on Friday to send your application. Or you can also read this uh, this excellent book uh, where everything is explained about Kleros and decentralized justice uh, in a much more clear way than I, I could do this, yeah, do here in like uh, these minutes. Uh, so the final concept I want you to know is like decentralized justice is this new um, new science, I would say, a new field within the, the, the law and which combines different uh, different fields, including economics, computer science. And it's based on like three main pillars. First, blockchain. So all the systems are built on blockchain because they need to be secure, they need to be transparent. Uh, second is the collective intelligence. They are based on crowdsourcing and on communities as the agents that will resolve the conflicts. And also they are going to use innovative incentive systems as the one we just saw with the shelling points and, and game theory. Um, so this is a, a new uh, growing field in the, in the realm of, of law. And if you want to be part of the future of, of the digital transformation of law, uh, you can join us. And so that's that's my message for today. And welcome to Centralized Justice. And well, I can take all the questions you want uh, a bit later. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that wonderful session. Um, please, if you have any questions, you can drop them either on the Telegram chat group, or if there is a chat option on Zoom, you can also drop them there, and you'll be able to ask your questions very soon. All right, so we're going to go to our next presentation by Alice, and before then, let me introduce her to us. I present to you Halis Namuli Blazovic, an award-winning lawyer, international speaker, and author. She is partner, head of tech and innovation at Katende, Empower, and co-advocate. She has over 16 years experience she specializes in technology and the law with a keen interest in artificial intelligence, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, fintech, cyber law, and data protection. She represents some of the largest fintechs and blockchain technology based businesses, which are reshaping the mode of doing business in Africa. Her background is in PPPs, infrastructure projects, project finance, measures, and acquisitions. She's team leader of Legal Innovation Hub Africa, chairperson of Uganda Legal Tech Network, co-founder of Kampala Legal Akar, board member of the Innovation Advisory Board of the Uganda National Social Security Fund. Cyber security experts for the Security Institute of Governance and Leadership in Africa at the University of Stellenbosch. 
I'm Chase, Faculty Advisor for Digital Legal Exchange, a global training institute for leaders in a digital world. So now she's going to have the floor and give us her presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Faith. I hope I'm quite clear. Okay. 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 Very good. Um, it's very good, actually, that uh, Federico went first, just to make, I guess, um, all of us and the participants to understand um, the genesis or background of, of, of blockchain. And um, of course, the simple definitions. I always tell so many people that uh, the same thing that I find that um, the definitions we have are either very scientific and very technical, yet actually there's, there are simpler ways of uh, having um, uh, a good definition that everyone can be able to uh, relate with. Um, I always, again, simplify it as, as simple as possible to, uh, so that any average person can be able to um, understand it. When I, if someone asked me what blockchain is, I would just simply say it's um, a, a record system. And um, the challenge, I, sorry, the challenge I usually find is that uh, every time you talk about blockchain, um, the first thing that comes up to someone's mind is cryptocurrency. Yet there's just so much the blockchain technology <clears throat> can, uh, can do apart from uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, in fact, usually I simplify it to say that uh, <clears throat> if you looked at the way a smartphone operates, yes, the smartphone has is like, let me say like the, the technology, but then the different apps that are there are the different um, transactions someone can actually have uh, uh, <clears throat> use um, <clears throat> on the blockchain platform. So for example, cryptocurrency could just be like, you know, a Facebook app or WhatsApp app or, you know, the different apps. So there's just so much definitely blockchain can offer than cryptocurrencies. Um, I wanted today to um, focus more on the theme of the day, which is uh, the impact of blockchain on uh, the legal industry or digital transformation. And I think it's also, it's very important that uh, we understand like from what I've just told you that uh, there's just so much blockchain can offer. If you, don't, if you don't restrict your mind to blockchain and cryptocurrencies, then definitely you're open to uh, so many opportunities. I'm going to um, divide my presentation in three parts. One, how actually the blockchain, blockchain technology can help um, lawyers in their day-to-day -day lives, like it could be business or work. <clears throat> and then the blockchain technology, how it has, it is actually transforming the legal sector or legal industry and some of the use cases we have already on the continent or around the world. And then uh, lastly would be um, the various opportunities um, that have been, have come up or the very different um, areas of practice that have come up um, under the use of a blockchain technology that so many um, lawyers can specialize in. <clears throat> First would be I, it's good actually that uh, Federico went into the you know, whole definition and what all this is about. So for me, if I if you ask me what um, blockchain can do for the legal profession, it starts. I would start with uh, on a day to day basis um, <clears throat> how lawyers have what they have dealt with in the past. That, that means excessive paperwork, um, manual handling of everything, like from, of course, from signatures, um, 
keeping records you know manually everything has always been uh, manual it's just of recent times that definitely things are being uh, digitalized especially here in africa where we have all our records um, in, in cabins you, when a client walks in you pull out a physical file and actually you know refer to all the documentations on on, on the file but now that uh, is doesn't have to be the case anymore because uh, we are already um, on the legal market. There are cloud-based um, or I would say document management systems that are based on the blockchain where everything um, is able in good time or it's actually very transparent whereby every lawyer in the firm can be able to access um, the, uh, what, uh, can be able to see what, um, each lawyer is definitely working on, and also clients can be able to, um, uh, contracts can be executed uh, on the platform where in record time, the client can be able to access it, execute it, sign in, and you know, get the transaction done very easily. Um, and why, why is that actually, has it like been extremely important? for this kind of um, technologies to be able for people to uh, understand them or to appreciate them. Um, it's, it's more about the ability to just hold in a bit. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the blockchain, um, the, the, the blockchain platform rather that so many law firms are uh, being able to use right now, uh, you're able to, they revolution, they have been able to revolutionize um, operations within um, the law firm. And I think that also has helped a lot with the transparency when it comes to, to clients, because so many times lawyers, we, whatever we do, clients really have no, not much idea of um, how actually a transaction goes on from, you know, point A to, you know, point Z. But here we, blockchain platforms, the client is actually also able to get to know, you know, um, record time updates on what is going on. Um, they've, I've also actually come across uh, e-signature platforms that are, have used, uh, are, are using blockchain systems that, again, what does that mean? For a lawyer, you don't have to, you know, to, to, to use, you know, physical signatures. I know many jurisdictions in Africa still require physical signatures, but I also know um, <clears throat> many jurisdictions have come up with electronic signatures where, you know, all these are um, acceptable. So just from the start of what can, is it possible actually for a law firm or lawyer to use, a, what they call it, a blockchain platform to like run a, a, a law firm. All these uh, <clears throat> cases, uh, all these uh, rather so many programs have come up uh, or platforms that are being able that lawyers are able to use to help them um, be actually more efficient, more transparent, and uh, more more cost effective. When you talk about cost effective, it means that clients are definitely going to um, be able to to hire you because you you're able to reduce their uh, costs of, 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 of operation. Um, the second part I want to share is um, the multiple use cases in the legal industry that uh, are already, um, um, ha we are already experiencing. Um, in summary, it could be smart contracts, Federico talked about them uh, in land, um, registration of land, or land registry, um, or registration of land or properties, into intellectual property uh, rights platforms, um, electronic evidence or uh, uh, custody of evidence, litigation and settlements, and financial transactions. When I talk about litigation and settlements, it means uh, dispute resolution platforms and financial transactions all on the blockchain platform. Um, 
what would I mean by use case a uh, blockchain uh, use cases of blockchain in, in the legal industry? Again, I'll start with the smart contracts. Ordinarily, uh, I don't want to dwell so much into smart contracts because I think Federico has done a great job. So um, it would be more rough. Parties can transact online and execute uh, the, the contract online and also be actually able to enforce it online. The best example uh, Federico has given is if actually someone fails to pay, you have you the person or the uh, the party to the contract has the ability to be able actually to execute and or to um, get a remedy through specific performance um, on using smart contracts. Um, so, but also smart contracts have uh, have have been extremely are being rather extreme, extreme uh, instrumental. Um, in doing away with the human error and a lot of fraud that definitely we have seen that has um, takes place um, in our day-to-day -day lives. When you talk about smart contracts, it takes it, it's taking away um, it, it deals deals away with a lot of the biggest percentage of fraud when it comes to um, drafting contracts or altering contracts. Um, and <clears throat> this has, of course, slowly by slowly, um, is also helping for the smart contracts, um, like I mentioned earlier, are increasing efficiency because parties don't have to move. If everything is done online and executed in good time, you don't have to move from point A to B to execute a contract or to have a um, to agree, you know, or, on something. And also that also applies to um, execution. So the, and when you talk also about smart contracts, this has, is happening in all like sectors of the legal profession where this can, smart contracts can be used. Then we have a, a chain of custody uh, where evidence can be safely stored. Like for example, Many and um, some of you, I guess, who are, have done litigation, you've had um, scenarios where it's so difficult to track uh, records and um, to, uh, to 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 accurate, accurately track what exactly happened in record time with the blockchain platform. If you're to definitely uh, record or store uh, evidence, it makes it much easier because. The, the platform, first of all, the transparency, everyone in case of any, any kind of changes and everything, everyone would know in, in record time that um, this aspect of this evidence has been changed and actually it can't be changed unless the authors uh, or all the parties to the transaction have consented. So that the fact that there's a platform which is which can be able to record that kind of evidence, it means that uh, when you use this kind of information in court, you're going to have more accurate um, uh, evidence uh, produced in court. You're going to have um, more, of course, ju justice uh, delivered um, in our justice system, which is a, a very, very big problem um, at the moment. And then um, when you also talk about, I mean, you can easily have safe access to forensic reports where in, whatever reports that um, have been uh, have been sh are shared on the on the <clears throat> on a blockchain platform could be used you know several years later without being altered which definitely increases access to to justice fairness um, and of course very very cost effective uh, litigants don't have to pay a lot of money to be able to um, um, have either this kind of evidence tracked, accurately tracked and produced in court. If the, the justice system or let me say the courts have access to the platform, they can be able to track in record time, everyone will be able to know what exactly happened um, or transpired in a particular case when you're resolving a dispute. Um, the other use case would be in, under intellectual property where um, 
that content creators are able to have been able to um, register their art or um, works online and no one is able to actually tamper with their, their records unless they, they, the content creators have approved that change. And also when you talk about um, in Uganda, recently we had a, our registration bureau try to consider the use of blockchain platform to uh, register intellectual properties because it reduces the approval time for everything. Right now, it can take within a minimum of a month to it would be six months where you're just waiting for your patent to, to be approved. And because everything is manual, you have to depend on the human error. Right? There's a lot of back and forth, come back tomorrow, come back the other day here. It makes it very easy where you just put in your the information, you as of course the content creator and the regulator is able to approve uh, your application in record time. Under intellectual property, you're also able to quickly resolve co copyright disputes because again, this information is immutable. It is on a platform where everything is transparent, meaning in case of a dispute, a copyright dispute, you don't have to, it becomes much easier that who was the first actually to, you know, to register um, this copyright. You don't have to go and uh, pay such fees in, I don't know how many jurisdictions or different um, districts to be able to, 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 to confirm who was the, the, the first, um, the first use of a, a particular, or who has the, the original rights um, to such a, a particular artwork. So why? This is all because of, you know, the, transpa the, the transparency of the platform and um, easy access for every, every, every party or anyone actually who would want to uh, access um, this information. You have to understand about these public, um, there can be public public uh, platforms where like for, this would be mostly used by government authorities where you have um, the government, instead of the government registries um, accessible to everyone. And you can also in record time carry out a search and know who, who actually owns a particular intellectual property right, when, who, to whom it is assigned to, when it is expiring, all this information in record time, anywhere you are, you will be able to access this information. Um, another use case that uh, we are, I know that is being tested in several jurisdictions in Africa um, is uh, land registry, land registration. <clears throat> and this also has, has the potential to, um, do away with uh, a lot of fraud that has has um, been part of the real estate industry for so long and has has created a lot of actually disputes um, in the in the uh, arising out of land disputes and all this is because of uh, the fraud that definitely um, takes place in this industry um, why because again a lot of human error and that. Um, capacity to be able to, to uh, change um, the records. In Uganda, when you have a property, you have three copies, whereby when you have a, a registered property, the owner has one copy, <clears throat> the land registry has a copy, and then uh, the third, and then the third print is also actually uh, kept sorry by the land registry and, and then the third copy is out for the public to be able to uh, like carry out a search and all that but then you find that someone can easily register their property and you know get a transfer and everything is you know is it turns out to be or preserve uh, presumably turns out to be correct uh, and tr and true meaning according to the record of the uh, land title someone has but guess what? A year later, someone can easily go to the land registry, bribe someone, and that property is transferred to someone else. And when it is transferred to someone else, what does that mean? It means that um, 
you can it means you you will have continue to own you think you still own a, a property but then it has really been transferred to someone else um and then by the time you go back to the land office and or find out actually that you the property has been has has been transferred to someone else um then you get into a legal dispute and then it takes like one two years ten years you've not got a uh, a solution it turns out to be actually a very frustrating uh, uh, process but with the blockchain platform um, for land registration in record time you're able to know when your land title has has uh, has has, uh, has been tampered with you're able to know who has carried out a search on your property who is um, who wants I guess to buy your property um, land transactions can also be uh, everything can of course using smart contracts can be executed online meaning I don't have to move from here to uh, another another town where the property is or I mean to meet the other the, the seller or the buyer the only uh, physical requirement for it would be like for example a lawyer now a lawyer that's when a lawyer comes in to confirm the existence, actual existence of the property. But everything can seamlessly go on online using the, the blockchain platform. And lastly is a, a dispute resolution platform. This is a very similar to what uh, Kleros is uh, doing uh, or what Federico has explained in his um, presentation, where you have an opportunity from point A to Z to solve a dispute um, online using a blockchain platform. For example, party A, I have a dispute against party B. I go online where on a I sign up on a blockchain platform. On that blockchain platform, they, they're registered like lawyers with their specialization. You can actually be, be, be able to see the reviews those lawyers have. And then you choose a lawyer, you contact that lawyer online, you um, communicate your dispute and then you're able to actually file your documents online without moving an inch from your comfort zone. This could be in your home, it could be in your bedroom, it could be anywhere. And then after that, the other party is also, um, uh, what they call it, uh, notified of uh, the complaint that has been uh, filed against them and then they respond, everything is online. And then you can make payments for your, uh, for the, for the filing fees you know, online. Currently, right now, most of, I mean, before COVID, um, you, have, you would have to move several kilometers to go to a court or to go to bank first, to the bank, and then pay, line up in a bank, pay, my, my, uh, pay uh, physically, then take that receipt to the court to prove that actually you've made payment. All that is time wasting and, you know, actually, makes the process quite lengthy. Everything now, we have, again, Federico talked about the use of mobile money. It definitely has scaled across Africa and so many um, countries are able to use mobile money. But for us in Uganda, this only came up after COVID. So thanks to COVID that now courts are allowing the use of mobile money. Before, that was never the case. You would have to do everything physically. And with the dispute resolution platform on the blockchain, you're able again to make these payments online. And you're also able to have virtual hearings. Again, in Uganda, thanks to COVID, we are now able to have virtual hearings. It was quite unheard of, unheard of to have, especially for commercial, commercial cases. We had had uh, virtual hearings or introduced in the last, I think for the last five years, but these were like in special cases, you had to make like an application, and you know, prove a case that uh, you actually um, need a virtual hearing. But that meant that uh, because the process was so rigorous and of course um, low internet use by the court and of course um, some you know, litigants, it was quite difficult. So most of the uh, visual aids we were having were manned by the state, meaning especially with children courts where they didn't want the children to come in court uh, because of, you know, in those like horrible scenarios where they, they're scared of giving evidence. But now virtual hearings are very uh, common, thanks to COVID again, 
where <clears throat> you just have to you know make a case that definitely a, a witness cannot travel all the way from Japan to come here because of COVID and you know a virtual hearing is set up. So with a blockchain platform, all this definitely was already in the pipeline. But every time we talk about virtual hearings before COVID, it was like you we were talking about um, we we're talking speaking Chinese. But now people actually are able to what we are seeing now on the continent is that people are willing now to listen and try to understand what exactly these kind of platforms offer. So after the hearing, I mean the judges, everyone are being online. You can receive your judgment again online. You still don't have to travel, which this, this uh, platform, this uh, process saves a lot of time for all parties. In Uganda, and I'm sure in many African countries, this is also this happening where you travel, you wake up in the morning, prepare your witnesses, go to court, and then find that the, the judge is not there. He has gone for a workshop, the judge is sick. But you with a blockchain platform, you in record time, you would know that you don't even have to travel because you've got a notification that judge is not available. Um, so it saves time, definitely it increases transparency. You 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 have it it would be it would give definitely an opportunity to very many vulnerable people on the continent who don't have access to justice. Um, in all corners uh, of Africa, rural or urban. The most important thing is you being able to actually access this platform and then you're good to go and have access to justice. So those are some of the use cases uh, I thought I, want, I would wanted to share that are already in, in some jurisdictions. Of course, we have more use of these ca use cases being, um, sorry about that. Hold on. Yeah, in some cases, rather in Africa, you'll find um, some of these use cases have uh, already been test, tested out, some are being used at a minimal level. Um, but I, I genuinely think that uh, if more people were able to appreciate uh, the use of the blockchain uh, technology, would uh, the legal profession would be transformed tremendously. And so many of the ills that definitely have um, troubled our justice system will definitely be able to get rid of them. And then lastly is about the areas of practice that are, have um, emanated out of the use of the blockchain technology. Uh, there's so many, um, but uh, there are just a few that I can uh, talk about. Oh, actually, before I go into the areas of practice, um, another, Another aspect that is definitely changing the legal profession uh, is uh, regulation, the regulatory industry. Um, one, first of all, uh, regulatory bodies can be able to use blockchain platforms. I talked about that in the, under in the intellectual property use cases. For example, if you're to collect taxes online using the blockchain platform, everything is, uh, it would be, is automated, good, in, uh, is transparent. You could know exactly what taxes you owed in good time. You're able to, you know, transact everything online. You can be able to get an approval online without, you know, having to move around. Um, so, so many regulators actually could use this. But also the regulatory in, uh, aspect I wanted to bring in is that this technology has to be regulated. And um, uh, we definitely, as uh, the legal sector, have to uh, put this into um, a, a lot of consideration and and lobby for, uh, I would say, specific um, regulation that controls uh, regulates the sector. However, it's all not doomed yet. I, I would want to say that we already have on the continent um, several can some countries that have um, have uh, regulations that regulate the blockchain industry. Because when you talk about blockchain regulation, there are many aspects to it, um, like data use of data is a very big uh, aspect of uh, use of blockchain and i know many countries i think about 27 or 29 countries now which have passed the data protection and privacy <coughs> act that you're able to regulate uh, the this industry which is extremely important the electronic signatures act in uganda we have one access to information act because computer misuse act with all this by the way you're able to actually regulate the <coughs> the uh, blockchain industry, although we will need some specific regulations 
uh, some specific laws and regulations because like I told you, that you, there are so many use cases and all these definitely need to be uh, taken care of. And also in consideration that uh, so many of our laws right now on the continent are deal with post digital era. So there's not much flexibility if you're to apply to, uh, the use of blockchain uh, technology. Most, in most cases, you'll be definitely on the wrong side of the law. Um, lastly, is about the practice areas. I find that uh, the, it, it, it has also opened up the legal profession to uh, a lot of uh, potential and opportunities, especially for the young uh, lawyers, um, so that you you don't have to feel you know to be crowd to feel like uh, you, when you get out of law school there could be so many other options actually you could you know take up because I know for certain the legal profession is kind of oversaturated there's so many lawyers on the continent but it's also very easy for you to. Uh, uh, tailor out a, a practice that uh, can give you a, a lot of opportunities. And <clears throat> wh how, how do these uh, areas of practice come up? Because of the blockchain use cases that um, are, are, are right now um, being uh, either ex experimented or have already, are already on the continent. I'll give you a few examples, like in the, in the agriculture sector, in Uganda, and I know many op uh, op uh, companies or businesses in the agriculture sector that are using blockchain platform to um, in the agriculture sector to uh, track or to uh, to track uh, operations of farmers um, in different countries. Like for example, in Uganda, we have uh, blockchain uh, companies that are able to. Uh, um, track uh, farmers from like, for example, from different regions, for example, there's this particular coffee company that you, they're able to know in good, uh, with the farmers for coffee in each specific area, which helps a lot with logistics so that when you're a, a coffee company, you don't have to, you know, guess around how many farmers are in which region. It becomes that this information comes up easily on the platform where you know, uh, in this region, there are these kind of farmers, and this kind of this kind of coffee they grow because all this information is on the blockchain platform. And this kind of kind of fertilizers they use, this is the kind of prices they have. It actually has also benefited farmers and given them, has empowered them and given them a certain leverage where, by they also get to know which farmers are uh, within either their areas nearby or in other in other places uh, in the country and also on the continent. So, you know, they can put share ideas, share information, because everything is transparent and online. And also that has also um, helped given them um, their credit ratings to go up, whereby you're able to, uh, because your digital identity is online, your asset, digital assets are registered on, online. If someone is able to give you, can easily is give you access to credit uh, because, your because of your digital identity anyway. There's, there's so much going on in the agriculture sector using the blockchain technology. And of course we need lawyers there to help um, the farmers or these uh, like coffee or the, um, uh, agricultural companies um, to, who, can, who need representation and also help them, especially in, in the regulatory environment. Uh, in the health sector, in the pharmaceutical sector, you have uh, drugs being tracked um, on, uh, all over the world from the manufacturer or the chemist actually even who mixed you know, the, whole, the concoction to the consumer. So it's a, it's a very big industry in the pharmaceutical sector. Um, energy, um, I talked about the land, uh, real estate. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the blockchain technology has definitely also created so many opportunities or areas of specialization for lawyers. And I think it's important that we take up these opportunities um, I, I would want to summarize that uh, despite all these, uh, the potential actually blockchain has, there's very few lawyers who, who, who have, have been able to appreciate the use of blockchain technology. Um, and also uh, judges in my country, I don't know any. Uh, okay, if maybe one or two, but still not in so much depth. Maybe they've heard about it, they're keen about it, but in terms of if you have presented that case before them using um, blockchain, they would uh, struggle definitely to understand what you're talking about. 
So what does that mean that even though these uh, platforms are available, it will take a long time, a much longer time to um, have them like implemented and enforced to their full potential because um, there are few lawyers on the continent who have been able to appreciate um, this industry. But uh, I always believe that there's so much hope um, in the young generation because you guys, I mean, if you're young, definitely it's so easy. This is a new industry. It's so easy for you to take up the opportunities and be able to turn out, uh, tell out a practice for yourself. And of course, I, I personally, I also believe that if you want to implement um, anything to uh, bigger a magnitude, it's always good to start with a younger generation. So the ball is in your hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alice. Uh, so good to follow on the presentation. Um, please, if you have any questions to ask our panelists, you can drop your question um, on the question and answer button that is just at the top right. And we have a question there already, so we are going to take that now. For those who still have questions, please sit and ask a question at the question and answer button at the top right. So, Alice, I think there's a question for you. So, I'm going to just read out the question and then you can have the floor to answer it. Um, good evening, panelists. How can the conflict between smart contracts and privacy and data protection be resolved, considering that the fact that a data subject has the right to alter, correct, or delete his data, and also to have a central controller of data, which are impossible with smart contracts? So how can the issue of the right to forget and all of that be reconciled with the immutability features of the blockchain? Okay, um, first of all, when you talk about the data subject having the right to alter, correct or delete, it's not only when you, as, as a contract would have two parties, right? So with um, on a blockchain platform, where if uh, uh, a data, sorry, if any party wanted to delete or alter that information, they can, um, sorry, they, if they wanted to delete that information, the other party has to agree or has to consent because it's already part of a contract. So you cannot just wake up and say, you know what? I don't want now Alice, my name to be used. I just want um, Namuli Blazavich to be used. The other party to the contract must also consent. But also when th that information is altered and changed, it remains as part, it is just remains on the record. That is when you, now go into the details of actually understanding how the block system works, that block of information will be there. So meaning still, up, if you wanted to refer to it or anything, you can still be able to access it. The only thing is that the new record, when, when it's changed, all parties have to agree to it. Um, so no, no party has, you know, a high, a, a big, uh, what they call it, um, more rights, you know, than the other. Then when it comes to data privacy yeah, and uh, privacy and data protection, yeah, this is a very big issue that in the data protection um, space uh, that always comes out about. Because like I told you, blockchain is all about transparency. But I also mentioned that uh, there are private uh, um, like platforms and also public platforms, meaning for privacy, like for example, where um, it's not an, a matter of, you know, I guess public concern and all that. You can have like different keys whereby only the parties to that transaction can be able to access that information. Um, but then when you talk about like public um, registries or public transform, for example, that, the example I gave you when it comes to registration of properties, um, every, when two, a party um, uh, registers their property, the government owes it to all citizens to know who actually owns that property because it actually helps with a fraud, you know, to deal with a fraud. So that is, that would be a public registry or record system. 
So, but then if uh, all parties want to have some kind of privacy to the data that is on the blockchain platform, they are keys. We call, they call them keys. I think Federico can explain that uh, much better, where you, you, you only the parties to the transactions have um, access uh, to that information. But I'm sure Federico can be able to uh, explain that further. Um, I can go into the second question. I mean, that uh, I mean, aimed at me, and then uh, Federico can answer the other questions. Um, how can the issue of uh, I can the identity issue be resolved? Pardon? Um, should I read the next question? I can. I was saying, how can the identity issue be resolved if blockchain is applied in real estate? Um, I guess the question is not very clear, but the, the person who sent it, you can clarify it. When you, but I can try to answer it. Uh, if blockchain is applied, that when you register your property on the blockchain platform, all your the information is there. Name, age, where you're from, just like uh, right now, if you register in your property, the property must have your name. For us, it has your name, date of transaction, everything was uh, about you. Although um, until recently when you had like, let me say digital identities, it was very difficult even to trace these, the owners of the property. But now with the digital identities, we have our national records identities. They are somehow tapped into most of these uh, regulatory bodies, meaning the national identity uh, regulator um, is able to share your information with uh, like the land registry. So they can know all your information is already there. Alice Namuli, Lazarvich, uh, lives here, works here, and all this information. And this can actually be shared in the real estate. So you can easily trace people. Um, but uh, again, like I said, you can clarify your question. Then the other one is, uh, if, uh, what are your views on the use of blockchain in relation to store of public and private health data, especially relating to health data privacy? Again, it's the same thing, like I told you. If it's a, if it's a public, um, if, uh, the, the, the platform you're using is a public uh, platform, then there you you wouldn't put some my health health um, health records for the public to view. You understand? So they they I'll leave this I think for Federico to explain because it is more technical. Then I believe blockchain doesn't reveal one's identity. How can this be resolved in land transaction? How oh, I believe blockchain doesn't reveal one identity. How can this be resolved in land transactions and registration? Land transactions and registrations are usually controlled in my country, I know, and many African countries. They're controlled by the government. Otherwise, if it wasn't, then there would be, I guess, more chaos. So governments usually have a central system where all this information, how all the plots of land they are demarcated by government and government surveyors and everything is recorded in one central place. Now with the blockchain, you're able to access this information in record time and know exactly also what is going on on your property in case actually someone wanted to alter it. But I wanted, um, I kindly request uh, Federico to explain the different uh, systems we have in terms of privacy or the different keys that are available. Yeah, so I think that, uh, and I also see this pattern of questions regarding privacy. Um, uh, so um, the first question asks about um, how, how can like uh, data be modified, uh, corrected uh, without a central controller. I think that the answer that Alice gave was the right uh, on spot. You know, um, you don't want uh, any central authority to modify anything. You want both parties to have to agree to. Uh, the conditions of the contract and without any of them being able to unilaterally change uh, the, the contract. Um, blockchains are by definition open systems uh, based on the people who uh, can observe the transactions. Uh, um, and so what Alice mentioned is like someone can propose to make a change in the contract, but it's going to be like and if both parties consent, it's going to be recorded in the blockchain. The, 
the past version of the contract and the change version. So you can see, track all the history of the contract and uh, no one can like, no one can hide that there was a previous contract and that was changed, right? The, 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 the record is going to be there. Um, and so um, the question about the identity, uh, this is a very big area um, because some people are asking, so why, why, so why should that identity be issued by governments? You know, we all have um, identities that are not government issued. Like you have a Facebook account or a Instagram or WhatsApp. So, and you sometimes use your Facebook account to log into other services in the internet, like uh, log to your Facebook account or your Google account. And that's kind of your digital ID uh, that you that is being controlled by Facebook and they know everything you do. When you are using this Facebook uh, login into any service, Facebook knows everything that you that you do, basically. Uh, and uh, so one big question about all this is that should we have like um, uh, a system of identity which is not controlled by governments or just one part being controlled by government or like passport part but maybe uh, other parts of the identity uh, is not government owned like there are like lots of projects working on this issue for example one of them is very old one called uport what they try to do is you have like your passport um, your like digital identity that you can use to log into different services uh, and the question is, okay, how does this interact with the land registries? That will a government land registry accept this type of identity for for recording your land in your name? And you know, uh, this is one of the main um, like uh, problems that blockchains have. Blockchains are very good um, systems for recording data and for making sure that this data is not altered and it's not tampered with. But you know, when it comes to enforcing some blockchain decision uh, or some blockchain whatever thing into the real world, you still need government to, to participate uh, because in the end, the power of the government comes from having people with guns deciding what, uh, what should be enforced, right? Um, I think that for governments, blockchains are an opportunity. Like if you, if you are a, go a government that you want to um, you want to have your people um, more um, have a better environment, better better rule of law. Like you want to use blockchain if you have a very corrupt system. Like if your bureaucracy is corrupt and it's not reliable, like you as a government will want to to rely on blockchain uh, a, a lot, right? So I think that um, in the case of Africa, and also in the case where I come from, I'm from Latin America, um, and you know uh, our, our our regions are quite similar in the sense of having quite weak governance systems in many aspects. You know, uh, well, I, in Argentina, had a lot of hyper, hyperinflation and uh, very weak currencies and, and lots of problems there. Um, and also a very corrupt system. You know, I, I would imagine that ha many African countries share with um, uh, Argentina or other Latin American countries the fact that the court systems are not very good and people don't have access, right? And Alice was very rightfully mentioning the case of um, uh, mobile money that I also mentioned before, you know, what, what did M-Pesa do in, in Kenya? It was, and this, this is not blockchain, this is like digital money before blockchain. Uh, this is a, a, a new way to solve the problem of not having access to a bank, right? Uh, I think that, you know, um, I think that our regions need to be like uh, way less afraid of, of these problems of um, that blockchains can potentially bring and embrace all of the potential benefits. You know, we as we as uh, people from Latin America or from Africa have a lot of, lot of things to gain from having a system of money that is not controlled by government, which can be inflated as government wish or, and we also want to have like um, lots of, small uh, claim system which are going to be based on, on blockchain be Kleros or, or some other like Kleros is just one but there are others and um, I think that we have much more to gain than, than to lose in, in our situation with, with blockchain uh, technologies 
because in the end it's a tool for transparency, right? And uh, so on the on the bad side, and coming back to the question, yeah, blockchains are open systems, and it may have some uh, cost in terms of of um, of uh, data privacy. But you know what? Uh, this cost you have in data privacy, you gain it in terms of transparency. Like in lots of situations, the data privacy is not really a problem because court proceedings are anyway public, right? So that's not that shouldn't be a problem. Um, so then, I think it's you need to, to do like a more fine grained analysis and see okay in which cases you want to you, you think that data privacy is fundamental and you would not want to use blockchain, but in which others you can trade off a bit of that for more transparency. I would argue that the, what you can gain in transparency more than compensates what you can potentially lose uh, in privacy, at least in a very, very large number of, of cases. Um, also, just to, <clears throat> to add on that, that uh, when you have uh, that digital identity which we've been talking about, you have like a, a, like private keys or access you know, to this information. So only you with that uh, identity can be able to access certain information. And it's also very possible. Like I told you, there's a private platforms and also there's a public ones. So if uh, you, you're the only one who has access to uh, a particular, uh, uh, what they call it, record system, it will only be you. So you can, you can actually make a decision. Um, it just becomes more difficult when it comes to uh, regulatory bodies who need who actually always work as public registries because we've always had that information like who who who, are, who owns this uh, property who does it belong to who sold it from who how many people before be, right now with the manual systems we have in most african countries is that it's so easy to do with that information and someone you know just because of fraud but like federico has said in case uh, uh, on the blockchain when you alter that information first of all yes you have the new information but also that all the information is there. It is kept on the date it was altered or the date it was, you know, um, uh, what they call it, uh, the date it was um, registered on, on the platform. So all that information is there. And the, the seconds, the minutes, everything is recorded. Thank you, but asking the questions. I think all questions have been answered. Okay, so welcome. Do any of you have anything else to tell us? Well, thank you very much, uh, Faith. That was an awesome organization. And thank you a lot for to Alice for participating, I'm sure. We will have lots of different projects to, to do together with uh, with Alice in, in, in Africa to transform the digital, yeah, uh, you know, landscape of law and how this industry is, is changing around the world. And I think that you know, emerging economies have like possibly the possibility of of being of leading this revolution instead of like coming behind. So I have just to thank you, Alice, and maybe you can say some final words, and then I will let fade. Uh, do the closing remarks for, for the conference, which was really, really well organized. Okay. Um, I think my closing remarks would be that the fact that uh, I just I always want to um, uh, interest as many people as possible to venture or to try to understand this technology and also not to limit their minds to the crypto aspect of it. Like I said, there's so many, there's a lot of potential using the blockchain technology. And when you also look at the, post, the potential it has on the African continent, especially, or like uh, Federico has said with emerging markets, um, the potential it has to solve long-standing problems we've always had uh, on the continent is, 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 is something that I think when you weigh the, the, the disadvantages, or the cons for, for blockchain, the, 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 the opportunity, right, the advantages definitely out, outweigh the, 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 the disadvantages. So 
uh, and it's also good to all, always focus. Let's can we focus on the good of what the technology has, as opposed to constantly um, disregarding it. I've, I find that has has been very common, um, uh, especially with government authorities. We talk about blockchain, and the first thing they bring it is cryptocurrency. This just come, and I'm like, that's one aspect of it. But anyway, so I would want to definitely leave you with. Um, uh, I try to um, an emphasis on try to understand it the, the potential it has what it can do for Africa how it can solve problems like corruption um, how it can be able to provide access to justice to the millions and millions of Africans who have you know have either find it very expensive or costly to access justice and also you, we as as lawyers how it can actually be able to to benefit us in the way we deliver our uh, legal services in a more efficient, transparent, and cost-effective way to our clients. That's it. Thank you very much for honoring our session. We are so grateful. Thank you, Federico, too. Uh, we are so grateful to our participants who have stayed with us from the beginning to the end of the maiden event. And we hope to have more events like this and more discussions like this in future. So we would want you all not to just be spectators, but to be participants and be pioneers of all the opportunities that we have already discussed today. So we hope you will be able to sign up from Clarus and look at the practical solutions that Clarus is offering to um, the decentralized justice system. So you don't just want to hear theory, 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 theory. Now, when you're able to sign up on theory, you'll be able to see how these things work life and practicalize it. So um, we also have our Telegram community where we can have um, daily discussion and daily engagement. So if you haven't joined us yet, you can join us. You can find the link in any of the emails you've gotten from the event sites. You'll be able to find the link there and you can join us on Telegram. And you can also invite others to join us and continue this discussion after today. So thank you all very much. We are all grateful. And we hope you all have a nice day and a nice weekend ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye to all. <laughs>